mystery house. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. You said the story we're doing tonight, Death House Blues, is very unusual, Barbie. In what way? Well, for one thing, Dan, you never see or hear the hero of the story, and yet he's very definitely the hero. You don't say it. Anything else? Yes. The whole story takes place in one room, the governor's office. Well, I'll be darned. It's an unusual story in other ways, too. Well, how does it start? You mean you don't know how it starts, Mr. Glenn? Well, of course not. I haven't read the script. Oh, but surely you know how it starts. It starts the same way all good mystery shows start. <laughs> How's that? Why, with a brief message from our sponsor. Okay, boys and girls, you all have your part. Places, everybody, except the scene town. Death House Blues. Tonight's story opens in the governor's office in the state capital of a distant state. Governor Burris is sitting at his desk as the dynamic Terry Rogan criminal lawyer speaks. The governor doesn't seem to like what he hears and says so. Great Scott, Rogan, you act as if sending this client of yours... Uh... This Eddie Banks to the chair was a personal pleasure to me. Well, I think it is, Governor. You feel it's a popular thing to do. You think you'll get votes by letting this kid be killed for a murder he didn't commit. Oh, please now, Logan. I'm not quite that bad. Just because you and I belong to different political parties. It's politics that keeps you from granting executive clemency, Burris. And you know it. The word has come to you that Eddie Banks is supposed to fry. Listen, Rogan, if you're insinuating that anybody tells me how to run my office... Well, I'll take the stuffing out of your shirt, Governor. It's too late for me to be polite. The kid's supposed to go to the chair in an hour. I've been fair and patient with you, Rogan. I've granted two stays of execution. I've examined all the evidence thoroughly. I've... You've uh... played to the grandstand all through the appeal, and you know it. You've granted two stays because you knew it would keep the case alive in the papers and keep you in the spotlight. Now, let's not be nasty about this, Rogan. That isn't a sporting thing to say, and you know it. Sporting? You can talk about being sporting when a man's life's about to be taken. You're darned right I'm not sporting. As his lawyer, I'll hit with anything I have. If I could put you in that chair in his place, I'd do it. I'm sorry, Rogan. Honestly, I am. I, I rather liked your client the time I talked to him. Of course, his background isn't conducive to belief in his integrity, and I couldn't blame him for lying anyway when his own neck... He isn't lying, Burris. Try to get that through your head, will you? Look, the kid hasn't got a dime. I've been working day and night for the past two weeks trying to break this thing. Why do you think I'm doing it? A very touching speech, Rogan. I think you're doing it because you have political aspirations and you saw a good chance for a tangle with me. You as the champion of the oppressed. A fighter for the underdog. Oh, that's rotten, and you know it. Eddie Banks was convicted on circumstantial evidence. He didn't you have... like screaming about circumstantial evidence, don't you? Well, there's nothing whatsoever wrong with circumstantial evidence. For some reason, there's a popular belief that circumstantial evidence is bad. When circumstances combine to indicate that a man is a killer, he usually is. The court... Come, Scott, I wish you wouldn't walk in here unannounced like that. After all, this is the governor's office. Oh, show it, Burris. I knew you and you were running for alderman. I've uh, just been up to the big house. You saw Eddie Banks, Comstock? Yeah, he's taking it big. Got a last hour story from him. The boy's hard as nails, well, uh, What do you want here, Comstock? Why, uh, I figured there'd be another last-minute stay. Maybe. Then you figured wrong. Eddie Banks was tried by a competent jury and... I'd be tampering with justice if oh, I... Oh, nuts. You don't need to make a speech for me, Burris. Uh, and if you think I'd quote a line like that, you're crazy. Some of our readers might have sensitive stomachs. Now, see here, Comstock. You presume on your position as a reporter. What do you want here? Why, I've got a photographer outside. I thought maybe you boys could give me a good pose with Rogan banging his fist on the august desk, class of legal minds, you know. Uh, well, now, listen. 
Well, I, I, I don't know. You go straight. I, I, I suppose we might as well humor the press. Eh, Rogan? Oh, no, you yeah. go straight. Look, Forrest, I told you this is no cheap political trick with me. I'm arguing for this kid's life. Uh, he didn't kill that dirty rat, Dickford, and you know it just as well as I do. Well, the evidence, Rogan. Somebody <laughs> trained Eddie. Trained him with phony evidence that doesn't even hold together. The cry of the man who gets caught from time in the morning. I was praying. Expecting anything that might make a good human interest, I'd like, Governor? Why, uh, Eddie Banks' sweetheart is supposed to see me at the 11.30. Last minute request. She's waiting outside now, but who's the dirty little guy with her? What? Madeline's out there? Why didn't you say so? I thought you knew. Uh, send her in. Okay. Ah, uh, there's a true blue loo for you, that girl. The way she's stuck by Eddie is... Is what? Well, it's proof that Banks is innocent. No girl would be as loyal as that unless she actually believed that he was... Oh, hello, Madeline. Hi, Rogan. I brought along a character. It's a little late for new evidence, Madeline. I know. This is Patty Lasker, Rogan. Hi. He has some bearing on the case, has he? Sure. Just like a lot of other people have had. If you'd believe him. I'll listen to his story. Go ahead, Patty. The night Bickford was killed, I'm standing in the mob in front of the club mirror door, see? Yeah, well, what of it? I see a guy I later learned is Eddie Banks coming out with a dame. This dame, who brung me here tonight? Well, that was established in the trial that Eddie had taken Madeline to the club. There was never any argument about that. And he had a fight with Bickford on the dance floor over Madeline. Hold still, Rogan. This little guy's got some new stuff, whether you think it's important or not. All right. Go ahead. Banks and his dame, they kind of edged their way into the crowd. Banks was dressed in soup and fish, see? And I bumped into him. A little hard. I don't when see. I bumped into him, my hand brushes against the side, and he ain't carrying any gun when he left the club mirror door. How do you know? I'd stake my professional reputation on it. Your what? Patty's a professional pickpocket, Rogan. If I gotta be blunt about it, I was frisking the guy. And there's no rat. That's for sure. I'm sorry, Miss Martin. It isn't important testimony for one Not thing. Not important, and... Governor. They never found the murder weapon. Bickford was shot, and they said it was Eddie who shot him, but they never found the gun. Bickford followed Eddie and me home. He was shot after Eddie dropped me at my apartment. Eddie wouldn't have had time to pick up a gun anywhere. This man, though, he couldn't possibly know whether or not Eddie Banks had a gun on his person. No? Have a look at this. Yeah? What is it? It's Eddie's wallet. Patty got it in the crowd. Hmm. Rather neat trick. I'm afraid it won't help us any. But it shows definitely, if they'll believe Patty, that Eddie couldn't have killed Bickford. The testimony of an admitted pickpocket hardly strikes me, Miss Martin. See, Miss I... Martin, like I told you, I wouldn't have done any good. Just got myself into trouble by getting spotted by cops in the courtroom. I suppose you left the money in this wallet. A great lift that was. Five bucks in it. But, but that's not true, Patty. Honey, five bucks. When Eddie and I were in the cab going to the club, he said to me, how would you like to take a look at real gold? And he pulled out his wallet and showed me $5,000. Oh, look, lady, I never got no five grand. I, I believe you, Patty. And I'm pretty sure I know who got it. Who? Bickford. He was the guy who received the dough for the crooked politicians. That fight between Eddie and Bickford was a fake. It gave him a chance to wrestle around just long enough for Eddie to drop the 5000 in Bickford's pocket. Eddie was paying off. If such a thing were true, it seems questionable. I mean, uh, if there is a, a political payoff, why didn't Eddie Banks say something about it when he had his day in court? Huh, I, I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yes, how? Hello, Warden? This is Madeline Martin at the governor's office. It's terribly important for me to talk to Eddie Banks right now. Oh, thank you, have him call me right back. Goodbye. This is a trick of yours, Rogan. Well, I didn't even know about it. I never heard of this pickpocket before. My name's Patty Lasker, Mr. Rogan. You don't need to keep calling me a pickpocket. The credibility of Eddie Banks' witnesses have been bad all through this case. Well, what do you expect? Eddie was working for Spike Polto. Spike owns gambling joints all over the country. Who do you expect Eddie's witnesses to be except the people who know him? My dear... How did an attractive young lady like you ever uh, become acquainted in a person like that? I'm not so high class myself. Eddie's a swell guy, and he didn't like the idea of my waiting tables in a gambling joint. He talked me into getting a job for less money, slinging hash in a restaurant. And he was going to stick on with Polto until we had enough money to get married. Uh, excuse me. Uh, That's uh, for me. I'll get it. Uh, Hello? Eddie? Darling... You've got to tell me the truth. This is terribly important. 
Did you really have a fight with Victor that night, or were you paying him off some payoff money for Pozo? What? $5,000. I knew it. But why? Why didn't you say so? What? Oh. No, I, I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh. Well, there's no time to discuss it, dear. I'll call you later. Goodbye. Well? Eddie says he gave Dickford $5,000 and the fight was all a phony. The fight was supposed to be over you, wasn't it, Miss Martin? I don't know what it was supposed to be over. The prosecuting attorney said Eddie was jealous of me, but that wasn't so. That scuffle was Eddie's way of slipping Dickford the $5,000 payoff right out in public. The place for that to have come out was at the trial. Why didn't he talk about it there? He says Rogan told him not to mention it. What? You mean to say that Rogan would deliberately perjure the client? You admit that you told him not to mention it, Rogan? I didn't ask him about it in court. Neither did the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney had no knowledge of what happened. He couldn't ask. But you deliberately withheld evidence. Oh, don't look so pious. You can't deliberately run evidence into a case that makes your client look bad. Look bad? If I'd have asked Eddie Banks about that payoff in court, he'd have been in the electric chair by now. Are you insinuating that our courts aren't honest? I'm insinuating that Bickford was playing with the party in power. If we'd started talking about payoff money, they'd have framed us with everything in the book. And besides, the payoff just gave another motive they could throw against Eddie Banks. But that's not so. What motive? Well, you had testified that Eddie was trying to get enough money to marry you. He knew that Bickford had $5,000 on him. Knew it because he'd given it to him. But so much a lot of other people, bad people. Pozo gave Eddie the money to give to Bickford. Pozo could have told some of his hoodlums about it. Look, Madeline, I appreciate that you're desperate. So am I. But the story about the payoff money doesn't help a bit. Now, really, it doesn't. I think the governor will agree with me that it's better left out of the picture. Now, about that, Governor. If you're insinuating that any bribe money gets to me, I resent it, Rogan. And the Bar Association's going to hear about your counseling a defendant to perjure himself. I did no such thing. I merely advised him not to, well, not to talk about things that would get him into trouble. Watch yourself. What, what are you... Pardon me, mister. Sorry, I bumped you. Here you are, lady. Is this what you wanted? What? She stole my wallet right out of my pocket. She... Yeah. Well, give it to me. You have no right to... Maybe I'm beginning to see a few things, Rogan. This is kind of interesting. What is it? Poto's private phone number. By any chance, are you working for Poto too, Rogan? You and Eddie both? That'd make everything that's happened kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Comstock, you back again? I do wish you'd knock the I don't have to knock when I have news like this, Barry. It'll knock you right off of your seat. And uh, I guess you might as well call the big house and tell them to get Eddie Banks off the electric chair. You know, they're due to turn it on in 25 minutes. What is this big news you're talking about, Comstock? They just found Spike Poto with a knife through his heart. What? Yeah. And a note on his chest that said, This is for Eddie Banks, a right guy who got a wrong rap. Is Eddie Banks guilty of Bickford's murder? And who killed Spike Polto, the gambling king? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. Meanwhile, here's a brief message from our sponsor. And now, act two of Death House Blues. The scene is still the governor's office, and the clock says 20 minutes till midnight. Fred Comstock's reporter is questioning Rogan, the lawyer for Eddie Banks. So, uh, it was because you were looking out for Eddie Banks that you didn't bring the payoff money into the trial, eh? And Madeline finds you were working for Spike Polto. <laughs> That's very funny. I don't like the way you say that, Comstock. Sure, Polto hired me to defend Eddie Banks. Eddie was one of his boys. You've been spouting about how Eddie didn't have a dime and that this was a labor of love as far as you were concerned. Why, you practically had me in tears. Look, what difference does it make whether I get paid or not? The important thing is to get the kid off. 
Now, he didn't kill Bickford. The looks of things now, one of Poto's boys did it, and Poto picked Eddie for the fall guy. I like your methods of operation less and less, Rogan. I, uh, well, I was listening to you with some little favor. But now, you're just a gangster lawyer. A lawyer who covers up evidence not to defend his client, but to defend the man who's paying the bill. What you think of me doesn't make much difference, Burris, as long as the kid gets to live. And you better start making up your mind fast, because there's only about 15 minutes left. You can't make them kill Eddie. Rogan's been working for Polto, not for Eddie. He's been letting Eddie take the rap. That uh, phrase, take the rap, Miss Martin. Wasn't there something like that in the note that Comstock says the police found on Poto's body? What do you mean? You came up here only a short time ago. And you uh, had a criminal with you. Me? I never heard anybody in my life. I'm wondering if you might not have visited Poto before you came here. Are you trying to say that I killed Poto? Somebody killed him. As soon as this execution is over, I'm going to ask the police to check your movements this evening prior to your coming here. Governor, why should I kill Polto? You fancied this gangster Polto was responsible for your sweetheart being in the death house. You thought perhaps that his murder, together with the note, would throw suspicion on somebody else, would make it look like somebody knew that Eddie Banks was innocent. That's wrong rap phrase. It's not too difficult a picture to grasp. Oh, for heaven's sake, Governor, it's just 12 minutes till I'll set Eddie into the electric chair. There's plenty of time to talk about Poldo's murder later. I'm talking about it right now because I think it applies to the case under discussion. My guess is that Poldo's murder was a daring effort on somebody's part to confuse and distract me. You think I killed somebody just to get you mixed up? I don't want you mixed up. I want you to have one thing clear, that Eddie didn't murder Bixley. But the note on Poldo's chest... Forget about Poldo, can't you? Forget the note. In 11 minutes, the man I love is going to the electric chair. He's a nice kid. Even if he was working for Chris, he enjoyed life. He loved each other. I'm sorry for you, my dear, but I can't let my personal feelings allow me to turn loose a man who should pay for his crime. I've always felt there was a place for sentiment in law enforcement, but it isn't right or just to let any man get away with murder. Eddie didn't murder anyone, you fool. Can't you see what's happened? Maybe we better go outside, Madeline. We're getting hysterical. I'm going to have to work fast to get Eddie off now. You get him off? You never wanted to get him off. You never tried to get him off. Take her outside, Comstock, will you? She's cracking up. Uh, I guess you better, Comstock, at that. Pardon me, Jinx. I've come here with the little lady, and she ain't leaving until she's down good and ready. But you... You have the audacity to pull a gun in my office? Kind of funny, ain't it? Me, who always shied away from force. Who got into the dip racket because it didn't have no violence. Me, holding a gun on the governor of the state. Well, I'll, I'll have you thrown into jail for this, sir. Okay, suit yourself. I've been in jail before, but the little lady's going to stay here as long as she likes. Thanks, Peggy. Now, I want you to listen to me, governor. Rogan sold Eddie Banks out. He put on a great show of trying to help him, and all the time he was trying to hurt him. Rogan wants Eddie to go to the chair. Poto paid him to watch that. The one really important point of evidence that could have helped Eddie, Rogan held out. He's given Eddie wrong advice right from the start. I'm leaving, Barrett. It's five minutes of twelve, and this thing looks like a hot story to me. Boy, I can just see it. Gun crazy pickpocket holds governor at bay while killer fries. Stop it. Don't talk like that. You ain't leaving, bud. Not yet. If I had an opportunity to kill Poto, so did Rogan. Before he came up to your office tonight. Well, you're out of your head. And you're wasting time that I could be spending in pleading Eddie's case. There's only three minutes to go. Governor, you've just got to see it. Rogan's been tied up to Poto. He deliberately put Eddie where he is. Why, looking for Poto, Rogan could have even been the one who killed Bickford. Oh, Governor, there's only two and a half minutes. For the love of heaven, grab that gun. Grab it. Call the warden right now. I'll dial the number. You've got to do it. If you just hold off a few minutes, I'll prove to you that it's Rogan who should be there and not Eddie. Put that phone down, Miss yes. Martin. I'll make my own telephone calls without any help from you. And this show of hysteria isn't helping the case at all. I have to consider facts, not the emotional outburst. You have to consider yourself, too, don't you? You're going to have to live with yourself after Eddie Banks is dead. After I've proved that Rogan framed him into the electric chair for a rotten crooked gangster. And you're going to be guilty of murder than Eddie ever was. 
How's it going to feel when you discover you killed an innocent man? I'm sorry, my dear. I'd like to help you, honestly. One minute, only one minute, Daddy will be back. Turn up. Oh, do something. Don't sit there like a fool. It's a human being, and it's, it's a human life you're playing with. You're not changing your mind, Governor? Uh, if you leave this thing close, Rogan, it slips back. Oh, what you. difference does it make how it left? Listen, Rogan, you were at the club here the other night of the murder. You saw the fight when Eddie slipped the money in the Vicksburg's pocket. You'd have been the one person there who realized what was happening. You... Wait. You say he was at the club near the door? There hasn't anything been said about that before. But there was. I mentioned it to Rogan right at the start, and he said neither Eddie or I should ever say anything about it, or folks on the jury would think Eddie had a lawyer planted in the club to establish an alibi for himself. Oh, you grab that phone, grab it, only ten seconds. Try you might make it. I'm afraid it's too late, Miss oh, Martin. No. I couldn't possibly get through in time. <laughs> Let him be out now, Fred, and don't let this chick <laughs> puppet get out of the building. I'm going to attend to him. Okay, Governor. You know, I am so sure. I didn't ask you to be sure of anything, Constant. Get them out of here. I want to talk to Rogan. Okay. You killed a man. You're a murderer. Well, in the name of the state, I'm going to have to put you under arrest, Rogan. Yeah? On that perjury business? No. You killed Bigfoot. You don't say. You killed him for $5,000, I suppose, and Foto finally told me what had happened. When he saw how you handled Eddie's bank defense. So, you had to kill him, too. You left that note about Eddie Banks to throw anybody off the scent. <laughs> you have a great imagination, Governor. I don't think I have, Rogan. I'm quite unimaginative as a rule. So unimaginative that I'm going to have a handwriting expert compare that note with your handwriting. Going to have fingerprint experts look for your fingerprints. Going to trace the knife they found in Poto's heart. And I imagine I'll find some very interesting things. Yes, I imagine you will, Governor. It's too bad you won't be able to do anything about them, isn't it? Just what do you mean? You try to do anything to me for killing Poto, and I'll ruin your whole career. You haven't cut this out yet, Governor. But you're going to see a great light. You don't dare touch me on Polko's murder, because the minute you do, I confess Bickford's Victor, murder. So, you really did kill Bickford? Sure, I killed him, and that's why you can't touch me for killing Polko. Just how do you figure that one? The minute I confess I killed Bickford, you're so washed up in politics you're a bum. Yes? Sure. The girl gave you all the dope straight, and you let an innocent man go to the electric chair. How does that make you look to the public, Governor? You not only look like a sap, but a vicious sap, a dangerous one. You can't touch me without smashing your whole career. You've been very smart about this, Rogan. Or maybe sharp is the word. You played every angle, didn't you? I always play every angle, Governor. There's only one little thing you overlook. What? This. <laughs> I, I don't get it. You wouldn't have the nerve. And putting you under arrest for the murders of Bickford and Porto. Just a minute. Hello. One. Cancel everything. You can turn Eddie Banks loose now. Thank you. Oh, I, I don't get it. He was to be electrocuted at one minute past midnight. I know. Well, it's eight minutes past now. Eight minutes past midnight by my clock, Rogan. What? I set my clock 15 minutes ahead tonight, Rogan. 15 minutes past. I had my doubts about the boy's guilt, even in spite of your bad pleading that he first passed you. You tricked me. Yes. You... Yes, I tricked you. You know, it's going to be fun letting that reporter Comstock know about this. He said I was stuffy. I don't think I'm stuffy at all. Do you, Logan? <laughs> Thank you. 